Hey everybody, how you doing? I can't tell you how excited I am to bring a longtime friend of mine, uh, actress, model, voiceover artist, Kelly Hu. And when I started playing video games on this particular channel, uh, I really started to get involved. What does it take to put together a video game? And of course, voiceovers have been discussed and I realized, oh my goodness, Kelly's done a lot of these and has even been at Comic-Con and, and all kinds of stuff. And I even learned some more about some upcoming video games that she's done voiceover in. So anyhow, uh, just thanks for hanging out. This is uh, a very unique, fun podcast. Uh, we, we, hit our, we hit our subject matters, but we also had a little fun just catching up as well. So enjoy. All right. Hey, everybody. How's it? Aloha. This is Jeebs here. And I'm so excited today because I get the opportunity, as you can see, to be with Miss Kelly Hu, who not only is an actress that we all know and for many years has been doing an incredible job, an incredible body of work. <laughs> 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 already, already. <laughs> ukulele, already. We got you already. Uh, but also, you know, especially here for this channel, is, uh, you know, voiceover artist and has mm. done all kinds of uh, voiceover. Uh, jobs uh, in, uh, I believe, anime, correct? If I'm correct? Uh, not really so much anime as much of animation. Yes. Oh, okay. Animation. Did you Have you done anything for video games? I think I've seen something. I've done quite a few video games. I okay, have what, a couple do you of remember them coming video out games? too. Which one? Tell me. Uh, cannot yet. You oh, know, geez. that's the thing with these video games. They're always so secretive. You know, like they all like when you're working, you're doing it under like different names, like and so and oftentimes, oh like, yeah, yeah. You know, I sometimes I forget. Sometimes I forget I've even done a video game because and somebody will show up at like one of the comic cons and have me sign like a DVD of a video game, and I'm like, am I in that? <laughs> and they're like, uh, <laughs> yes, you are. And then like, you stay drinking too much kava. That's why. No, it's because you know why? Because they all these games, they do it under these different names. Yeah. And because I'm not a gamer and stuff, I don't even remember what the half the names are sometimes. And then um, and then you're only in there for like a day. And then the video game comes out maybe two, three years later or, you know, comes oh, across my I desk see, like see, two, three years later. And so I'm like, oh, uh, what is that again? Yeah. Well, so what about the ones you remember? I have done uh, Mortal Kombat. Ooh, um, that's what that's that. I recognition that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played Devora on Mortal Kombat. Oh, uh, that's, that's the slick. bug lady. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what else have I done? I, I not did... a, not a big stretch for you, huh? I know. Yeah. <laughs> bug lady, you. What else and, we got here? And then I did one uh, where they actually use my likeness on um, uh, Battlefield Hardline, where I play a cop. I've actually um, heard of that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was a pretty big one for EA. Uh, what else have I done? Um, oh, there was a Batman game that I did. Yeah, I just noticed that. I'm looking at your IMDb and I'm going, first of all, Tells, I am sorry, but I had no idea at the amount of work that you've done for your career. I think it's phenomenal. I think it's- I'm old. <laughs> what, not, I've been doing this long time. Well, I tell you, uh, the only thing that might be giving away any kind of age is is the uh, is the embracing of the grayness in your hair, if you would. Oh, I know. I love my gray. I love. I think it. it's. I, I think it's great. I think you know. It's you. just there's been so much pressure on people in general, even outside of the industry, to to, to appear and be less of who they are in real life in order to appease whateverness you know that we've got in ourselves into habits of things not that i have anything against dying hairs or face no. you know stuffs or whatever i just think it's wonderful that i think i'm seeing more of a trend of men and women uh that are just saying oh screw it already i'm just this is this is what you notice i went like this yeah yeah <laughs> That's because i stay totally. all weight you know yeah. and everything you know but you know that 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 everybody's kind of embracing that and i think that also might be a little bit of a less pressure on any younger people maybe worrying about getting older is it yeah no scared it, no scared yeah, just you know I, I i you know it's so funny because my mom you know she comes from a completely different era her mm. hair's still all black like she keeps dyeing her hair and i was <laughs> like mom when you're gonna let that go i mean you have more black hair than me now i got more gray than you 
And she's Uh-oh. like, I'm just not ready. And she's like 85, okay? <laughs> you know, it's you okay. Watch. She's I not hope mom doesn't see this. Yeah, mom, mom no she's, watch. Gonna <laughs> <laughs> she's like, Pa, what up you already? <laughs> no, but um, it's okay. I mean, you know, you do you and, you know, if she does, if she's not ready, that's fine. I'm not mm. forcing her. I'm, you know, I'm just, I wanted to let her know that it was okay to go gray, but she, you know, she's just of a different era and she's the kind, she never leaves the house without full face makeup, lipstick, you know, nails done, everything, you know, and that's, that's fine too. If that's what makes you comfortable and, you know, and that's what you have to do to leave the house every day, that's okay. But for me, I love not having to go to the, you know, the salon and worry about my hair and, you know, having to be on it because it's like every three weeks or so. I mean, after like just a couple of days, I'll see like, you know, a little bit salt, you know, specks coming over here. And <laughs> and just to just having that freedom of letting it go and not yeah. worrying about it you know, the money, the time and all the chemicals that must leach through your scalp. Um, you know, I'm like done. I'm done. Life is too short for me to worry about that kind of stupid stuff. Oh, yeah. All right. Imua. <laughs> okay. So part of that though, that, that energy that you have and that, you know, forward, you know, wide open, positive energy for, um, for life, as we know it, as you just explained, just live life, you know, and full on and full on. This this body of work that you have here obviously goes from a you know um, a post winning of what what was it M- Mrs. Teen <laughs> was I, Miss I'm, Teen USA <laughs> Miss Teen USA okay everybody Not yeah Mrs. She, I've never been married <laughs> oh that's right I'm sorry I, I'm sorry I bobo I'm I'm, I'm bobo that way sorry. Um, <laughs> So if you don't know, folks, uh, she did win way back in the 1900s. Uh, when, the they ma- <laughs> yeah, when they still had pageants yeah, on TV. Have, uh, Miss Teen Hoy. And there's pictures on the internet. So if you'd like to look. And it wasn't too far past that, that I think it looks like if I'm looking at your IMDb here, unless there's something. Um, wait, wait, I have to put listed. clarity on that because it was yes, Miss Claire. Teen USA. Oh, Ms. I won. Yeah. So I was representing Hawaii. This was in 1985. I don't mind saying the year. I'm very proud of how old I am. So this was in 1985. And I represented Hawaii in the Miss Teen USA pageant. And um, and I ended up winning the national pageant. So slick. And, you know, there's Just such. Th- <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, you know, I don't know much about the pageant system, but nonetheless, so that was that's a pretty you know, um, big achievement, uh, regardless from where you're at, that's, or where you're from, that's still a big achievement. It was life-changing. It was absolutely life-changing for me. It it put my my life on a whole other trajectory. Yeah. So that being said, it looks like your very first job that I see here on, um, I was going to say Instagram, though (laughs) on uh, IMDB is Growing Pains, yeah? Yeah, that that was my first Screen Actors Guild job. That's that was my first union job. And um, and I got that because I was still living in Hawaii, fresh out of high school. And I um, I auditioned for this role uh, to play Kirk Cameron's love interests when they come to Hawaii on vacation. And um, oh, oh. yeah, it was it was it was pretty cool to be able to have this like under my belt before moving to Los Angeles. I had one, you know, job. I moved right after I finished filming, packed up my bags and I moved to Los Angeles before the show even aired. So it was, I was like, I was so ready. I was already, I already knew I was going to be an actor, but this was just confirmation, you know, for me that I was on the right path. And this gave me um, something to put on my resume. Um, But, you know, I have to admit the rest of my resume was all made up. You know, back then when you actually had to type out your resume and oh, then you sure, had sure, a sure. black and white photo that you attached to the back of your resume. Nowadays, you cannot do that, right? Because there's the internet and everybody knows if you're lying. But back then, there was no such thing as the internet. And so I had growing pains and then I had a bunch of other stuff that I just kind of made up. You know, I think I said I was in like South Pacific or something. And like, I don't even sing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but... But you could do that kind of stuff back then. Nowadays, you cannot get away with that. 
So you moved to Los Angeles uh, right after Growing Pains, before it even aired. Mm -hmm. And how long was it before you actually, did you have representation at that point already? Or did you? I did not. I, so how I long moved did it to take Los for Angeles. that to happen? I moved to Los Angeles and I didn't know anybody. I, you know, I, I had a cousin that was at USC. So I stayed in his dorm or in his apartment for a little while until I got my own place. Um, but he, you know, I, he was the only person that I knew. And, um, and I really just kind of took my chances, but, you know, then again, I was also, I had, I had, you know, the money that I had won from the Miss Teen USA pageant. I had, you know, a little bit on my resume. So I wasn't there completely unarmed. You know, I had a little bit to work with. Um, and I found, uh, you know, Samuel French, which is uh, a bookstore. <laughs> remember yeah, yeah. bookstores? I remember that. Wasn't yeah. that like in Studio City or something? Yes, yes. There was one in Studio City, one in Hollywood. And there was a book of agencies um, that were SAG affiliated because now I was in SAG. So I could look up all these SAG agents. And I did a mass mailing um, and I um, and I took out a full page ad in Variety with my headshot and a picture Good in a you. swimsuit going like this. And <laughs> it was like so ballsy that I didn't, you know, when you're 18, 19 years old, you don't realize that, you know, that kind of thing is a little bit, maybe too much, but you know, I thought you did it, <laughs> but I did That's it great. because, you know, when uh, I had nothing to lose and I sure. thought, okay, I'm, if I'm going to come to Los Angeles and I'm going to be looking for rep representation, I'm going to do it big. I'm going to invest in myself. Yeah. And um, and so, yeah, all, that all came out um, the day that Growing Pains aired, uh, announcing that I was now available for West Coast representation. <laughs> and how long did that take before, you know, um, and I got I got 20 calls before the show even aired. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's because you're because, also working. I mean, that's the that's the law of the land. I mean, if you're if you're pulling money, I don't care if, where you're at and you're needing representation. And when I mean where you're at, what what part of the creative world you're in? It could be music. Right. It could be whatever. If you're already coming in headlong with some success. Right. You know, that's when agents or people who are, might be interested in your career managers kind of go, oh, well, she's already established. We don't have to break her in through any of her basic, you know, get her in. On exactly. B-roll. B you know, and level I was, or whatever. I was younger than most, you know, uh, most young actors coming in because a lot of people, they'll go to theater school and then, you know, by the time they graduate, they're like 22, 21, yeah. 22 years old. You know, I was coming in as a teenager, but I was also over 18 so they could work me like an adult, like normal hours. Also at the time, it was the 80s, you know, so people still didn't have Asian people on their roster. And and mm. they wanted, you know, here was this ballsy girl who takes a full page ad in Variety and people are like, who the hell is this? You know, and why is she doing this? Because most people in Variety, they would take like a little ad out, like a, a little, you know, credit card size or maybe a quarter page, you know, announcing that they were going to be on some show to hopefully get people to watch. And I thought nobody's going to pay attention to that. If I'm going to do it, I got to go big, you know, go right, big right, or go right. home. And so so that's what I did. I, I took a gamble on myself and it ended up working. And I also, you know, from from the pageants, you know, I had the money to do it. So, you know, for me, it was it was not a huge investment, you know, because I already had this money from the pageant. I had all of this experience in um, being interviewed and, you know, running in the pageant, having practiced all of these interviews. So I what I did was I of all the responses that I got from all the different agencies, um, I took it to the guy who was my building manager um, because he was an actor and, you know, he was just managing the building to to survive, I guess, you know, to so he could have a free place to live. And I took him this list and I said, so can you help me with this? I don't know who to 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 contact or, you know, how to these are all the people that responded. 
And he looked at this list and he goes, do you realize I have been doing this in this city for 15 years and I can't even get these people to call me back, much less want to interview me. I had no idea how hard it was because I was so new and, you know, things in my life just kind of fell in my lap, it seemed. Um, and so yeah. he helped me um, pick out the top six people to to interview with. And um, and lucky for me, you know, the the one that was my favorite ended up liking me the most. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I you know, luck comes at the crossroads of opportunity and preparedness. Right. I mean, in my world, that's just how I see it. Um, I mean, if I find a dollar bill on the ground, that kind of puts that saying to rest. But, <laughs> but you know, look, let's face it. If you if you did have the uh, the balls, if you would, to take out a full page ad and just go for it, you know, that that's part of that, you know, working through life in general, you know, based on, you know, your stories through school and everything that you've gone through and whatever that that strength and that like i i'm i'm going i see what i want i'm going and i don't know why they're just taking out quarter truck or i mean quarter yeah. page and i'm going to do this and without a mm -hmm. doubt you know and once again you know the having that already that little bit of of success with um the tv show that you started with his you know being his girlfriend uh, what was what was that called again uh growing pains. growing pains yeah you know that that's that's like somebody put some fuel in your tank already. So once you're working, people already want, to, you're out there, you've gotten the exposure on a national, perhaps global level, mm -hmm. where I think any agent and manager would have said, well, she's out there now. And there's, you know, directors and other people are catching an eye of her, you know, so you were, it all lined up, as you said, you know, you got your experience through the pageant. Um, you took your chances in LA, you did this half page. And so it all kind of, you know, but you know, it was, it's all about timing, right? Life is yeah. all about timing and had somebody tried to do, if somebody tries to do something like this now, it would never work. It's not the same, you know, it's, it's a different era. And um, now it's all about like, how many followers do you have? Right. Um, uh, and you cannot lie on your resume. So people are coming out, you know, with big dreams with, you know, not a lot to work with. And, and that's, tough man that's really really hard and I, I I commend people for for taking the chance on themselves right but um but also at that time there were not a lot of Asian actors you know not a lot of actresses and certainly not a lot of people my age who were out there in Los Angeles you know trying to trying to get work and it doesn't cost an agency anything to put you on their roster you know so for them to just say, yes, we would love to have you, you know, it's like nothing, but maybe some time that it takes to like, you know, send you out on stuff. But, uh, but I had, you know, like I said, I, I had all this interview experience. So I, I quote, give good meeting <laughs> from what they tell me. <laughs> so all right, good. that's good. Yeah. And so it was, you know, for me, it was so easy. I was, I was able to, to find an agent right away and um, and an agent who really believed in me and and was willing to send me out on stuff that was not just Asian. You know, he really saw me as like all American girl. That's great. Uh, you, you got somebody like that behind you, then all you got to do is just make sure your wings are prepped and sail on whatever it is they send you out with. Um, yeah. And I had no experience, but that one growing pains, you know, the rest of my experience was just high school, high school drama club. And, you know, four years of, of Mr. Bertino teaching me drama. Um, that's what it takes. Everybody's got a wonderful school story of a teacher somewhere in the yeah. journey that said, you got this, or you were able to cherry pick great lessons from, you know, four years worth of schooling yeah. Uh, enough to, you know, elevate you and, and get you through. Um, looking at your IMDb page now, all of a sudden, right after that, you're in it to win it. You, you're you automatically within two jobs into Night Court, um, 21 Jump Street. You know, those are for all of us older folks. Who remember <laughs> those shows. But I mean, you really, you really crushed it from 1988, which was right after Growing Pains, till... I'm kind of scrolling up until 
I see your very first voiceover job. Well, and Jeez. also the things that are not on IMDb is all the modeling and commercial work that I had. So I, I actually oh, survived that. doing mostly modeling and commercials for the first 10, 15 years of my career. Um, these, these little gigs that I got acting, you know, were just sort of a, a great way of, you know, getting ahead in, in the theatrical realm, but I really survived and did quite well because of all my commercials. And, um, I was commercial queen back then. Yeah. I, you yeah. know what? For, I, I, you're right. IMDb doesn't talk about any of that and, um, yeah. or it doesn't show that. So I just, I was Bobo, I was surfing and baked most of the time. So I didn't watch a lot of TV. So I didn't see, I didn't see a lot of your commercials uh, at all. But, um, you know, like, as I'm going through this, um, you, your your body work is really super rich from, from film to TV. Obviously, uh, some people will automatically think of the Scorpion King, mm. uh, obviously, which it looks like you uh, kind of <laughs> stayed consistent with like fit model. You didn't have a lot of clothes on with that. Uh, <laughs> But um, and when you're shooting out in the desert and it's like 110 degrees, I was not complaining about being half naked. I was like, <laughs> thank you God. just had to stay hydrated, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But um, where I want to kind of turn this through is I see now the very first, at least here in on your IMDb page, um, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. It just says voice. Oh, that was my when, first video game. That's your first video game that you were in. What? Obviously, being a voiceover artist is being an actor without having to be filmed. Yeah. Um, so briefly, can you tell me what that first turn was uh, about? Like, did somebody, was it the tone of your voice or something? Or did your agent just say, hey, you know what? I want to submit you for, or did somebody hear you in an interview and say, hey, I think you'd really be good at this. How did how did your whole voiceover uh section of your career start and take off? You know, I, I didn't do voiceover until I, I, I had a, a long uh, on-camera career. So this, this video game just kind of fell in my lap. I don't even think I auditioned for it, to tell you the truth. Um, what year was that? I can't it even remember. It says 2004. Yeah. So I, I don't think I did any voiceover before that. I had already done Scorpion King and, you know, X-Men, uh, where I didn't speak at all <laughs> in X-Men, which is so funny. But um, but uh, yeah, this I, I guess it was just an offer because I don't think I even auditioned for it. And that was so much fun for me. It was being being able to I remember even being in that you know, sound booth by myself um, doing this dialogue and thinking to myself, this is awesome. I don't have to hit a mark. I don't have to worry about my lighting or pulling in my stomach or, you know, or, you know, like making sure that my eye is like not, you know, all caca. Like I'm like, like all I had to do was concentrate on my voice, you know? And that for me was like, a, a revelation to be able to act a, I didn't even have to memorize dialogue, which is awesome, right? You're just reading it off a piece of paper, but to be able to do that and have that kind of freedom of letting go of everything else and just concentrate on one thing, just how you sound was such a, a an awesome freeing experience for me. It's really a, a, a great, um, practice, you know, uh, a, a, an acting sort of lesson, right? To to be able to get rid of everything else and just concentrate on this one thing and just how you sound. Um, and it wasn't until even, I think, after much after that, that um, I fell into um, voiceover acting because after that, then um, my agent started sending me out on other auditions. And I think the first job I might have had after that was uh, uh, Phineas and Ferb for voice acting. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's a couple of those as well that are animation. Uh, also, I see that you did some voiceover in something called Afro Samurai. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and you just it's just such a great thing to kind of, you know, 
scroll through this and see animation, TV, voiceover, um, film, feature film. Uh, you've really done quite a bit of work here. Now, here on this channel here, a lot of people are going to know you from uh, some of the uh, video game voiceovers that you've done. Um, I'm noticing here that there's, um, and I don't know, it looks, it's, it says video game, a video game called Fracture and oh, another one called Ninja that. Blade. Something called oh my Ninja God, Blade. I don't remember that either. <laughs> and uh, how about Terminator Salvation? I don't even remember that either. Wow. Those are all video games? They're all video games. Well, that, okay. that might play into what you said earlier is that you're brought in to perform under, which is very common practice, I think, in Hollywood yeah. is when they do shooting, they have a fake name and a fake everything. And then they put it together and, you know, you're in it. Yeah. Um, also, let me see. There's some other ones here. Batman under the Red Hood you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, Green Lantern, Emerald Knights. Uh, what is that? Phoenix and Ferb? Phineas Obviously. and Ferb was Phineas. a was a animation on Disney that was their number one show for like nine years. That, that was must I think, have been fun. That was fun, you know. It, but but you know, it's one of those where you know you're in the booth all by yourself. You don't really get to see any of the actors unless you know they they happen to be in the booth working just before you. Right. Um, but but that job was the best job ever because I would get paid for an entire episode. And sometimes I would go in and I would have like two lines of dialogue. It would take me longer to drive to the studio <laughs> than I would actually be recording. Yeah. Now, do you think um, as I'm kind of scrolling through, oh, Scooby-Doo and the Spooky Scarecrow? How's oh, that? that? Oh, Spooky Scarecrow. Oh, there was another one, the Samurai one or something. Another Scooby-Doo that I did too. That, and the Teenage I got to Mutant play two Ninja Turtles? Characters. Yeah, I did Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for I think seven years, maybe for Nickelodeon. Another Batman you did. You've just done a lot of work here. Do you think, because I, I wouldn't know what it's like uh, uh, in, in casting and stuff. Um, I mean, you would think that every actor would have a voiceover reel because mm. you are still acting. Do you think uh, in your case, um, that opportunity and preparedness, which was called luck, uh, came into a little play here. Or do you think maybe perhaps there's a tone in your voice? Uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna lean into a little bit now the voiceover artsy fartsiness because I kind of I kind of my own world is kind of has a little bit of that uh, that has nothing to do with uh, entertainment on traditional. But I, I'm I'm curious about that. Do you think maybe that has to do with a little bit with uh, the tone of your voice and and you know and... it could be. I mean, when I was. I, I re people have always told me, oh, you know, oh, I, I heard you from, you know, and I, I knew that was you. Like, you know, people hear me down the block because my laugh is so loud. Yeah. <laughs> and I always assumed that it was just a volume thing. But yeah. apparently I have a distinctive voice or, a, you know, I don't know if it's the tone or whatever it is that makes me sound distinctive. You know, the, the accent, of course, comes and goes depending on where I am, what situation. I tend to speak more pigeon with you because that's how I know you. Right. We've yeah, known yeah, each yeah. other for so many years. Um, but, you know, I code switch, of course, for acting because that's that's how it has to work. So, um but I have been told by a lot of people, like, for instance, I'm on a show now called BMF um, and I go through the airport um, coming out of uh, coming from Miami back to Atlanta. And I was wearing my mask and glasses and and, you know, going through security. And some girl was like staring at me. And I guess because of the hair now, too, people recognize me from that. that. Yeah. And she's like, you're that detective from BMF. And I was like how did you recognize me? Was it my hair? And she goes, she goes, no, I kind of thought it was you because of your hair. But as soon as you spoke, I knew that was you. And I get that all the time. People are always like, I thought that was you. But as soon as you talked, I was sure that was you. Because I guess I look very different in all the things that I do. But my voice is somehow more distinctive than my look. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, I guess the cadence, um, maybe, maybe a little bit of that in and out pigeon, you know, Could there's be. melodic, we speak in melody, you know, yeah. even if you're not a singer and you, you can't even hold a tune, I, I think 
as a composer my whole life and, and always talking about music and healing and music therapy and stuff like that, I really try to reinforce that no matter how non-musical you think you are, anytime you're speaking, you're speaking in your own melody mm -hmm. and you're speaking in your own rhythm. And then of mm -hmm. course, the shape of your mouth and stuff. So you're actually singing in a, in a very odd, eclectic kind of way. Because People that's... ask me that all the time if I sing. And you know me, Jeeves. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> you, you laughing because yeah. um, <laughs> I actually have a phobia of singing that I've been working through. Um, I have been so scared of singing in public that my 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 throat immediately closes up. I start shaking. I start crying. It's it's really weird. Um, I started having to take voice classes, not because I wanted to be a singer, but because I just wanted to get over this phobia. You know, I mean, I remember being in acting classes and my 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 teacher knowing that I have this phobia after doing a scene in front of everybody in class would say, okay, now sing it. And I was like, <laughs> I hate you. I hate you. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I would stand there in front of people and I would be bawling. Like, <laughs> not just like a tear running down my face, but like, <laughs> like <laughs> ugly cry, ugly cry. But um, yeah, but it's funny because I do love voiceover and I do love all the fun things that I can do with my voice there. But when it comes to singing, that for me is like, there's something really weird yeah, that it's I can't It's a performance anxiety. I, you know, I, we hear that about must... it all the times when people go up on stage and they're nauseous, they're getting ready, they want to throw up. But oh, then as yeah. soon as they get out there, they do it. But then that's what they want to do. That's not your focus, obviously. So when you're confronted with that, if that at least, if, if that acting coach was getting you to do that was to possibly push you just through a fear factor, not because you weren't there to learn singing, you're no. obviously there to learn to, to act and stuff. That could have been yeah. that thing. But um, have you ever in your voiceover career thus far had to um, maybe uh, change the tone of your voice on request? Like I, I'm not, not, I'm not, yeah, not so time. much as like saying like, you know, how they do Marge and stuff on the Simpsons and stuff, but have, has the director at times have ever said to you. Like character you know, kind of voices. Yeah. Kind of snap into more of a, a can you yeah. be meaner? Can you be more, you know? Oh yeah, of course. That's what it's all about. Right. Yeah. That's, that's what voice acting is. Um, I'm not one of those people who can do great imitations or, uh, a lot of accents like there are like the real voiceover actors, the people who do this exclusively for a living are unbelievable with the kind of voices that ca that can come out of their bodies and, you know, like uh, accents. And, you know, I, I remember working with this one guy where they were like, okay, so we've got this other character and, um, you know, he's a uh, about 40 year old, a Midwestern guy. Um, so he does, you know, one version of the take and he goes, okay, well make him sound a little bit, uh, less educated. And so then he does another <laughs> version of the take. Oh, um, age him down like five years. Then he does another person, uh, another version of the take. Um, you know, let's make him sound a little bit tougher. You know, like, I mean, and, and these people can tweak these little tiny adjustments in such a way that you're like, wow, that makes such a huge difference. Like, I can see that. I can visualize that. But if you were to tell me to do all of these things, these it, it's it's these little details are so tiny that sometimes it's hard to get to you know i mean yeah. it's it's a gift and then of course all the different accents and age ranges and you know genders even it's um there are people who you know they have millions and millions of people that live inside of them <laughs> hey gosh nobody knows that more than me i mean I've, i'm definitely not a voiceover artist mm -hmm. but i have done my share as a composer putting together bundles for radio stations and also being available for voiceovers of commercials 
that, you know, on a local level, most of the time that happens at a radio station. If you do a radio buy, uh, one of the DJs or something will be the voiceover artist, you know, talking about your product. Mm -hmm. um, but in a lot of cases, when I was working with clients directly, part of the package would be, okay, I'll do the voiceover, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, for me, it's funny you should say that. All those voices that live inside, one of the newest things that happened to me, and I think you were you. I, I think I went to one of your events, a nonprofit event you invited me to quite a few years ago when I started. Is <clears throat> up until 2020, I'm doing ventriloquism for kids in hospitals and stuff, and I have a myriad of of characters. I have the healing dinosaurs for the hospitals, you know, and they have different voices and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, Brandon Pterodactyl. He's a tough guy from the east side of Jurassic Valley, so I give him kind of a Jersey kind of. Um, <laughs> Uh, what's the name of the tough guy that's in all the the uh, uh, the mafia movies? He's always scrappy, young or scrappy guy. Um, Joe Pesci. Oh, so he's got. <laughs> hey, 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 I'm looking here. How are you doing? What are you doing? I'm coming. You know, he's got that kind of vibe. <laughs> and then um, Wyatt has it. more of a kid voice. And then I have other puppets that I use for local things that I do, like uh, Malama Ik Kai stuff with my um, turtle uh, Makoa. He's got uh -huh. kind of that crusher surfer thing. But I have a shark because those are both, as you know, amakuas mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, the, the Hawaiian culture. So they actually get along. But I have to use really different voices. I actually, yeah, I, I actually kind of had to, I, I kind of bit off a little bit of uh, Stallone's shark voice in one of those recent movies where he's like oh. shark man or something. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So it's very down here and all, <laughs> and all, you know, very, and it's a very unique thing. I enjoy every bit of it. I don't consider myself a voice uh, actor per se, because I'm focusing strictly on, on kids and education, but right. it is an incredible talent. And, um, but what you do is so much harder because ventriloquism, you cannot move your mouth. So you're doing all of these characters on top of it without moving your mouth. That to me is unbelievable. Like yeah, I, it, I cannot imagine. I, I work out a lot of, uh, hostile, years of talking to myself with these poor puppets you know, <laughs> we have arguments with each other a matter of fact when i'm practicing outside i might be walking on the beach practicing i've told my neighbors if i'm walking up and down the beach my mouth is not moving and i'm just doing this it's because i'm practicing not because i'm bubble <laughs> you know what i mean but don't yeah, call I mean, any hospitals yeah don't don't be calling you know you know the police they like come out and just go oh she's bra okay come come we get spam musu before you come relax. but um well, you know, it, it is a very unique art form in of itself. I was very, very fortunate for a brief moment to get in, uh, in my window of that trajectory to work a little bit with Terry Fader, very famous ventriloquist. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah in, in Las Vegas. And then under his nonprofit, I did a little bit of stuff for him in Vegas. And 2020, I was supposed to go on a hundred hospital tour, March of 2020. I remember that. Throughout the United States, but COVID. Now I can't get back into the hospitals because uh, you know, you always have to be wearing a mask, a lot more stringent, you know, uh, protection. Not that if you're wearing a mask, anybody can be a ventriloquist, you know. Right. But, <laughs> but if, if a child life specialist called me up and said, hey, listen, we have somebody who has a real special needs and stuff like that and really loves, you know, dinosaurs, I'd still come in and do it. But you just it's not Don't like they have that. clear masks now, but I guess it would get all fogged up. So it doesn't matter. They do. Yeah. But it, but still, the the strict hospital guidelines nowadays it's plus be, yeah i have to admit in 95s with me getting a little older my doctor said hey listen you know we all love what you do here in the hospitals and stuff you know kaiser Capulani and and, and shriners and where i go here in in uh hope you but because you know you, your chest is slightly compromised already from all your years of you know all the funny things that you've done with your lungs oh. and you know you got to be careful now as you get older, you know, you can't chance that. So it's kind of made me kind of, so I especially are the worst. Yeah. For that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I, I focus a little more on now, um, like videos. I do th very special videos, uh, for kids. If uh child life specialist or people call and I'll just do like two, three minute videos, mm -hmm. uh, for kids and educational stuff, but that's, you know, but, but nonetheless, I mean, with your trajectory and what you've been doing, uh, with your voice, um, you you did kind of say that you have uh, there's a new something coming out you can't mention it, yeah. Uh, but a um, couple more video games, yeah. You have a couple more coming out, yeah. 
Yeah. That I'm working on right now. It's not, people are going to forget. I even said this two years from now when it's finally out. <laughs> no, 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 no. Trust me. People don't forget because on Twitch, I do. Um, when I announced, yeah, no, when I announced that uh, I was possibly going to bring you on for a podcast, my, my Twitch chat just lit up. Everybody oh. knew who you were and what you did and, and you're, you know, because it's that audience, you know, and that's so and awesome. That. And, and, and now shifting into something I know nothing about, except I see every now and then if you're posting pictures of stuff, I know that Comic-Con is a huge global mm, uh, phenomenon. You know, uh, uh, adventure, if you would, because mm -hmm. there's so many people that are involved or have become part of that, you know, uh, for music, we call it the soundtrack of life, you know, it mm. gets so embedded, but for video games, I find that to be just as impactful being that I'm brand new to it. Um, tell what was your first comic con like what was that experience like my first comic con happened while i was actually shooting x men so that must have been like 2003 or 2004 i think i think 2003 while we were shooting and the writers um uh introduced me to comic con you know i didn't even know that it had existed before that and they were telling me about my character and the background story and, you know, where she first appears in the comic books. And, and they were like, oh, I was like, oh, can I get one of these comic books? And they're like, you should come to Comic-Con and, you know, check it out. And, you know, and, and, and that's when I was like um, introduced and that back then it was like, you know, a, a, a huge event at 50,000 people. And now it's like over a hundred thousand people. Right. Mm. Um, but it was, it was quite the experience and, and I loved, you know, I, I'm, I'm all about like creative, uh, creativity and inclusion and, um, and representation and all of that. And I felt like, you know, seeing all of these people get all dressed up in these, you know, as these comic book characters and, and, um, and the fandom of it all. I was like, wow, this is a whole subculture that I had never even known existed. But I loved it because of all the creativity and it allowed families to come together and dress up together and have something to do that was fun that they could all do together. You know, um, watching people and the kind of costumes that they would come up with. That for me is always fun because it gives, it's like ha Halloween all year round, right? For them mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, go to all these different comic cons all over the United States, all over the world really now um, and, and, and dress up as their favorite characters or whatever. Um, and I just love people having this kind of creative outlet, you know, and, and not be made fun of. But to, you know, to be to be cheered on and, you know, other people who can appreciate what they're doing, um, you know, cosplayers and stuff like that. People wanting to take photos with them and becoming celebrities in their own right. I think that's great. I, I think one of the things that um, I thank you for letting me on that I am I'm so new to this world, but I'm loving every bit of it uh, mm -hmm. because, it, you know, as you get older, you look for new journeys and things to be excited about and wake up in the morning. In my case. Uh, my my Twitch gang and my and my um, RP Jeebs audio <laughs> oh it was RP Jeebs uh, audio arcade no music arcade I'm sorry that's the name okay. of my, I didn't know what RP Jeeb I guess is um um I don't know what it stands for it stands for something like they're all going to shoot me down for not even remembering this but it uh, has to do with a Japanese uh, gameplay oh I think, okay something like that like a single person. And all of a sudden I got into playing Minecraft. They showed me how to do this. And then another one called Journey, which was absolutely unreal. And now I'm playing Final Fantasy, which is apparently a ginormous franchise and stuff. And, you know, to see how involved people get in video games to the point where also they go to, uh, you know, a Comic-Con and celebrate and stuff like mm -hmm. that. It's such a unique universe yeah. You know, and they can be and they're very, um, very nice, very appreciative. It has its line of trolls for me because Twitch can be that kind of place where it's like I hear. Yeah. You know, but especially um, toward women. Yeah. Well, it's, it, well, that's because I think, you know, for the Twitch thing, there might be, uh, you know, another reason for that. Uh, that is beyond my 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 understanding. Just mm -hmm. me just observing it going, well, 
that's going to be pretty tough. And it's hard when you put yourself out there on that kind of a platform when it's live streaming and you got people coming in and out, you know, unless you put these stringent permissions on who can chat and stuff, right. it can be harsh. But um, the interaction with the fans must be really fun and completely unique with uh, Comic-Con uh, because yeah. I, I guess from what I've seen in videos and pictures that you're like sitting at a desk or whatever, mm -hmm. and they can come up and take pictures with you mm -hmm. and stuff. How do you like that interaction different well, from um, when you're doing, you know, TV, um, film, and you're just out on the streets and people might recognize you? Do you do you enjoy that? That relationship um, moment for 10, 15 seconds with each one of these fans, how do you feel? Absolutely. About you know, I mean, this is this is what I have dreamed of all my mm. life, right? You know, ever since I was a kid, um, it comes, you know, fame comes with also a level of responsibility. And, you know, it's 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 it has its good moments and bad moments. But but most of the time, I mean, who doesn't love to be adored and, you know, <laughs> you know, people coming up and telling you how much they love your work. And, you know, I mean, that doesn't happen for just anyone. I, I realize how lucky I am to be able to 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 have this kind of life. Um, and for me, I think the 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 the, the Comic Cons where, you know, people line up to to get to meet you and get your, you know, autograph signed on something and, and get their photo taken with you. For me, that's even more special because, because these are true fans and these are people who are so excited to meet you that they actually like spend time standing in line and offer you money <laughs> like just to spend a few minutes of time with them and i try really hard to give everybody a moment you know because because they can anybody can just go online and buy an autograph picture of me it costs like what eight dollars maybe i don't know what the going rate is for a kelly who autographed photo these days but but it costs far less than it would to actually come up and meet me at a comic con. So what I want to do is I want to give them that experience, you know, and show them the appreciation as much as I appreciate them as much as they appreciate me. You know, I, I understand how lucky I am to be in this business and who doesn't want to be in a business where you're just constantly adored by fans? <laughs> I mean, how lucky am I to be able to 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 be one of the lucky few to have a career in this? You know, I just I just did some research for another panel that I was on uh, a couple weeks ago, and found out that um, in the Screen Actors Guild, you know, the Guild of Actors, that um, the Union for Actors, I should say. Uh, only 2% of Screen Actors Guild members make a living wage. Only 2%. So people like wow, myself who have been able to flourish in this environment, it's like one in a million. It's like winning the lottery. Yeah, so lucky. Well, I mean, that's, that's I mean, you're, you're, you know, your expression of gratefulness through this whole podcast, I think is, is is really endearing to the fact that you know even myself as a composer the the, the chances of me have had the opportunities that I've had I am I am as grateful as can ever be even though I never really uh, I don't know sometimes it, how I say this and what it really means is a unique thing but even though I never really wanted to let's say become a composer the universe kind of guided me through a bunch of you know, big success, big wins and big losses to it before mm. I settled into, oh, oh, I can do this because I'm not a singer <laughs> or I'm mm. not a lead guitar player that failed or I'm not that good at this. Oh, well, what's going to happen? And one opportunity led to another that took me down, you know, the path of being almost 40 years of being a production music library composer, which is a very unsung, quiet little part of the industry. Yeah. And I survived through it. And now that part of the industry you know, is dying off really fast and it's so difficult. Can you imagine when AI starts figuring all that out? Oh, they already it? have. That's a whole oh. nother discussion I got coming around the corner of the poor composers right now because composers are the only ones that don't have a, 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 union. A, a union. 
it's been something that's been, you know, uh, a, a, a thumb in the eye for composers, but without getting into a long conversation about it, it's just been a very difficult thing for composers. Composers have unions. So like my dad had the uh, 47 in Los Angeles and, you know, there's certain things that they could do as, a, as protection, but outside of that, the ASCAP, BMI, SOCAN, yeah. all those other yeah. bodies, those are the ones that kind of keep an eye on us, but we have no rights of negotiations as a mass, where as actors, writers, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, uh -huh. in Hollywood and stuff, uh, there's many, um, at least when you're uh, in a SAG versus uh, a non-union, or when you're a GRIP and a gaffer and you're below the line and there's all these unions that are supporting across, you know, um, and uh, above the line even, you know, directors and stuff have their own unions, I believe. Not that mm -hmm. I'm using these yes. fancy phrases because I'm in it, but I just have friends enough that are kind of taught me what those sayings mean. Mm -hmm. um, to circle back about being grateful, I think, you know, you can't help but just go, oh my gosh, how did this happen? I'm so pumped. Except for me, what I try to do is give back. So yes. on these channels that I have on YouTube now, now that I know I'm toast, I'm done as a composer, as a composer. Uh, as far as a production music library composer career, it's over. It's done. My dividends oh. will kind of pay out for a couple more years and it's going to be done. At least now I can show younger composers on how uh, the best way to get, you know, the sounds they want out of their DAWs. Or if, you, if you're if you a composer and you want to sound like, you know, the music from Ori or from Final Fantasy or from Minecraft, at least I can kind of gently guide you in a way to explore. And that's where I'm at now to kind of punch back into that gratefulness but um you know that that world of being grateful too is also work you know there's also that balance of like so many things in life before you realize wow wait a minute I've, this has just been an amazing journey and i'm just over the moon for it and i can't you know for you especially i had no idea that you had done a couple more video games uh and and to be announced a little later do you I, I guess once you're in it, you're in it, and most likely more work will come to you and stuff. Do you find that there's a little more competition, let's just say, in the voiceover world than, um, I don't know if com competition's the right word, than acting, even though they're both acting, you're just I, doing you know, I think I think that the, uh, the thing about the voiceover world is that it's very... Uh, it's sort of it's niche and it's it's um sort of hard to get into because it's it's a very small community and mm. and you know these voiceover artists just work in everything so you know it's not, you know, you're never going to get tired of like you know there are actors uh there are tons of actors and you might get tired of seeing the same person over and over and over you know, you with voiceover, it's different because they can be so many other people, you know, that you're not you don't even know that you're listening to the same person um, for I, for me. I think the way that I was able to get in also is because um, all these these jobs are union jobs. Right. Uh, so you have to be in the Screen Actors Guild in order to be able to land a, a voiceover job, uh, especially when it comes to like animation and film and stuff like that. And so they have, if there's an Asian character, they have to cast an Asian person to play that character. And so there were not a lot of Asian artists out there doing voiceover work. And so I think I was able to kind of, again, you know, life is all about timing, wiggle in there before it got saturated with a lot of other Asian artists. Um, now, of course, there's so many, so many girls, you know, I'll go to a voiceover or, you know, I used to go to voiceover auditions. Now you just do everything, you know, remotely because everybody has a computer and equipment. Right. But, um, but yeah, there's so many other artists out there doing it who are Asian. And, and, and the thing is also, um, you know, age doesn't play that big of a factor as it would on camera. Because, you know, a, a, a woman who is 50 years old can still maybe sound like a 13 year old or something, you know? Oh, yeah, I guess we see that. I mean, when I when I hear the voices, when the voiceover artists show up for the voices mm -hmm. that, I don't know, Simpsons or 
or all that sort of stuff. Uh, and you just realize that they're, you know, um, uh, mature adults. Um, yeah. I know that there is, uh, and this is where we're now going to kind of uh, creep into the, the, the current Hollywood scene. And, and, and I, and I use the word creep, not, <laughs> not in a jabby kind of way, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that are going on right now. One is I know that you're a champion for, um, you know, that authenticity, number one, number two, uh, a champion, uh, amongst others, um, from, uh, from the Asian cultures, mm -hmm. you know, Vietnam, Philippines, all, all, mm -hmm. you know, uh, on, on more, uh, equality in roles. Um, and it seems like um, the global impact of that energy that some things seem to be changing in Hollywood, obviously. It sure seems like it. Yeah. yeah, slowly but surely. I mean, at the speed in which we would like to see change in certain things, that's that's our fantasy of how things move and how fast we should just hit a switch tomorrow and things will change. But it's 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 wonderful to see the energy of, of um, what's happening now when it comes to that so you know i know that you have been involved in podcasts um you know uh, supporting and talking through and uh, kind of maneuvering the language of that part of what's happening in hollywood but on the other hand you know the challenges of hollywood have now drifted into what's a strike and technology mm. and with the writers you're talking with about. With the writers, yeah, the writer yeah. strike, um, technology being involved in it. Uh, there's AI in the discussion. Yeah. Um, there is um, something that I'm experiencing as a composer. As my years go on, my my checks of which only amount to maybe buying a, a larger bag of coffee beans, you know, they get smaller <laughs> and smaller, but they get, what was once a value of at one point is less and less of a value every year. It kind of diminishes. Um, I know that the writers are suffering a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you start seeing that's the internet. The internet is people have an equal voice now. So if, if people get up and say, like, I've seen videos already on writers opening up their checks and saying, this is what I used to get. This is what I get now. Or oh, here's fantasy land. Everybody thinks yeah. because I'm a writer of this show, I should be doing a backstroke, you know, in my, you know, Olympic sized pool with Grecian pool boys giving me a towel. Yeah. And really here's my check. This is what I'm getting. And it seems yeah. like um, that's some of what is still being fought for now. Mm -hmm. In in your opinion, with the forward advancing uh, energy in a positive way of what's happening culturally throughout Hollywood, a little more embracing more cultures and roles, uh, a little bit more uh, equality, but being inside the industry the way you are as a professional, how do you kind of see what the future of Hollywood might look like? I know that's kind of a hard question oh. to throw out there. Uh, you because mean there's as, big as, mechanics a, as far it. as AI is concerned? Or? Well, just, just where Hollywood stands now as, a, as an entity of production of intellectual property, movies, TVs, uh, TV shows. Um, like Hollywood is still the biggest game in town, the biggest employment uh -huh. game in town when it comes to that. I know that I know that India has a very powerful, impactful production. Huge, huge. It's almost like what's happening, the shift of energies in, in the economy and the power of dollar versus whatever. I think my question really rounds off is, do you still see Hollywood being number one through and through? Or are you seeing maybe there's there's some shifts that are happening out there where uh, other productions, other things are starting to gain momentum that maybe this energy towards Hollywood being the, you know, Hollywood, we love them, you hate them kind of a thing, being the only game in town, do you see that maybe in the future there's other blooming possibilities in production where we're not so reliant on the Hollywood machine? I think that Hollywood is definitely here to stay. It's not going to go anywhere. Uh, but whether or not other things will take over, such as like streaming platforms like Twitch, I think, yeah, I think there's a strong possibility of that growing even stronger. I mean, look at how many kids now don't even own a television, right? They mm -hmm. don't watch TV. Everything they watch is on their computer. 
and and a lot of people don't even want to watch movies or television shows. All they want to do is game, right? All they want to do is watch things that they can stream on, you know, different uh, on, on on the computer on, you know, whatever different sites that they're yeah. into different platforms. Exactly. Um, and so and so, yeah, I mean, I do see other things gaining momentum, but whether or not that will end up taking over for Hollywood, I don't know, because I mean, certainly I don't think in our generation, I don't think we're going to see that as long as we're alive. But, you know, Ooh. then again, technology has grown so fast, even in the last 30 years, you know, or since social media has, or or the Internet has has been around. Um, well, I think you said something really important um, about the fact that there's less and less of the younger generations that are uh, watching TV or paying $50 for two people to go to the theater. When I mean $50, I'm talking about by the time you get in, you get your popcorn and stuff, you know, that yeah. the selling of the theater experience yeah. is now fading big time. It's like, okay, get maybe two weeks of a run in the theater. So it qualifies for X amount of awards or whatever and yes. hurry up and stream it. And then we'll make our money off of, you know, the streaming things. I think, I think the, I think the basis of my question really has to do with what I'm seeing in now because of uh, YouTube and other platforms that that people can produce eight minute, 12 minute shorts, festival shorts and stuff like that, uh, that the, the, the standard of production has changed in a way that it's become very prosumer, which means yes. anybody can do a film, anybody can do a short. Yes. And also because of the mobility of it, even though you can watch stuff on a platform, I do see also on that Congress side of things where you could see some of the old school cats are really kind of, you know, they've already been nervous about the internet, but how much attention is being pulled away from traditional. Yeah. Especially I mean, TV. look at kids nowadays. They spend, I, I don't have children, but I think that kids are spending more time playing computer games and on TikTok than they are watching television. Oh, absolutely. You know, so, so uh, yes, if, you know, maybe in the next generation, uh, television, there, there will be far less, you know, television, but look at how many outlets there are for television right now. When we yeah. were growing up, there were three channels and maybe four, right? Like three and right. a half, right? Because right. Fox or whatever that was, was on just like part of the time. They came a little and later. Yeah, that, that actually came on later. Yeah. But remember when there were only three networks and 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 at 12 o'clock you know they would shut down and you would yeah. see you know like they would play the like star a holding Spangled pattern Banner, of, of then, something exactly it would just be a dis <laughs> kids kids who are watching are going what yeah <laughs> it's you know it's a whole different universe now there are hundreds of channels that you can watch in so many languages if you have the that special box thing right you can watch from any you know any anything that's ever been made in any country um, yeah. And so, yeah, people have a lot more to choose from. And so these gatekeepers of Hollywood, as powerful as they are now, I think are becoming less and less powerful because, you know, um, they are having to compete for people's attention. And um, and with these kids nowadays, you know, they have to be more interesting than TikTok. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, it's a very unique time we live in. Um, I, I've been watching things on, on AI develop and, you know, um, writing scripts, writing um, uh, speeches, so music, composi music composition uh, with AI. The fact that a lot of companies are now training their AI internally on creators works in stock companies whether it be oh stock gosh. photos, stock music, stock motion yes. graphics. Now AI, they internally train that in there and even pull more of the amount of money that the creator is going to make. And still to this day, they don't know, really know how to track it because it's going to be a derivative of work. So I think we're living through some pretty intense um, time right now. And, and you know, when it comes with to the writers, ownership, right? Yeah, and exactly. Create, and with the and writer's creativity. strike, I, I, I feel um, there's, there's, 
this little, you know, hole in my heart of sadness about that, you know, with the writers and what they're going through. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody with their intellectual property, people who are photographers, people who are creative arts uh, individuals, this is going to be really a difficult journey to see what pulls through. And it's it's going to be a very paradigm shifting moment, I think, in, you know, these final few years of my life. Not like I'm knocking on the door, but at this age, you never know. <laughs> but, um, and the challenges that I believe the writers are going through for better compensation. I think it's a unique situation, too, because... I think unions support unions and somewhere down mm -hmm. the line, eventually one union is going to back another union, back another union. And this could right. potentially be one of those kind of major disruptors of not only um, core production, meaning studio through uh, distribution, post supervision, et cetera, et cetera. But then all the supporting businesses that support that. Um, it, yeah. I, I have a friend all of mine. The ancillary. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend of mine who's a post supervisor. And he had said, he explained to me how far reaching, you know, that is. Even here in Hawaii, um, you know, we have have been very fortunate to have one after another after another with uh, TV mm -hmm. shows, 5.0, Magnum PI, CSI. And, you know, it's great to see our local, you know, um, folks with all the jobs, grip scaffers, all the way to acting. I mean, we have quite a pool of actors and actresses here in uh, Hawaii that- So um, much talent. So yeah. much talent. And we've seen them even come up from the most inconspicuous places, inconspicuous kind of places. Like, you know, this one was kind of an actor, but then gets this part and all of a sudden they're on all the time they become. You know, so there, I, there's some very unique opportunity here in Hawaii and especially because of its rich base of talent, both in, mele in music, mm -hmm. acting, uh, you know, and especially culturally with dance and, and everything mm -hmm. so much so that, of course, you know, let's if you circle back into the Hollywood thing, they they dive in and we have all mm -hmm. these different kinds of animations. And and, and and the proof is, too, I mean, the, the speaking about the pool of talent that we have in Hawaii, I mean, you know, as you're seeing on American Idol right now, right? Tongi is doing so well. Right. Ian Tongi is doing so well. I mean. And then, um, you know, we just had, uh, I don't know if you watch Drag Race. <laughs> I am a huge no, fan of drag. But, no. you know. Uh, of drag uh, or Drag Race? Drag Race <laughs> is, you know, the show, Drag Race. Oh, oh I didn't know it was drag a show. Race. When you said yes. drag, I thought you were talking about like Drag Queen or what else. I, I am talking talking. of Drag Queen. Oh, you see, yes. I'm so old. So I got to get out of there's a huge show that that does very, very well <laughs> called Drag <laughs> Race, RuPaul's Drag Race. And um, and Sasha Colby from Hawaii won that. You see, and I'm then, so disconnected. I thought you were talking about drag racing, like the, the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. cars with the uh, <laughs> so well, I got to get out of my coconut more often. OK, right. I'm sorry, continue. No, but I mean, I love supporting, you know, my my drag, transgender, LG, everybody in the LGBTQ AI community. Um, then also there was a, a competition on Netflix recently of choreographers where another Girl from Hawaii won that as well. Uh, her name escapes me at the moment. But 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 Hawaii is just full of so much talent. When you think of how small the islands are and how few people there are that actually live in Hawaii and the talent, the amount of talent that comes out of there. You know, we got like the Bruno Mars, you know, Jason Momoa, uh, The Rock, you know, Dwayne Johnson. I mean, some of the biggest... Uh, paid uh, celebrities in the world are coming out of Hawaii. So yeah, the talent yeah. pool there is absolutely amazing. And I've always been, you know, peripherally, even though my career continued to be fairly successful, uh, you know, here in, in, in a very, like I said, quiet part of the music world, I have been so enamored by uh the artists of Hawaii that are in song, oh. uh, the voices, the harmonies, even in the more pop culture production of music, uh, which is this uh, kind of a, a reggae influenced localized uh, style of music, uh, so much so and, and so and it was is so good. Still has de a dedicated radio station uh, to that to that more. Uh, I think they. Uh, don't come for me in the comments, people, if you see this, but I think <laughs> I, I've heard it called Jawaiian or something, but oh, it's beyond yeah. that because the buttery, beautiful harmonies that kind of come through the culture 
Polynesian yes. types of harmonies, you know, different yes. parts of Polynesia have different types of types of expression of harmonies in their cultural singings that mm -hmm. that creep in and blend with um, um, let, let's say more R and B um, mm -hmm. pop culture performances and the ukulele and the, the style of musicianship that yeah. crosses over to, of course, traditional Hawaiian music too. I mean, I am right. such a fan beyond ridiculous of uh, Gabby Pa'anui mm. and the old school style music that all, of course, grew all the way through. Yeah. Some beautiful, you know, all that stuff uh, we grew up with. Yeah. All of it. For but sure. As you said, though, per capita, uh, Hawaii has yielded such an amazing and still has such a, a deep, rich base of talent. And for me, like you say, oh, we, well, we stay 2,500 miles out in the middle of nowhere and we yeah. have such a reach, you know, and yeah, of course, Breda is and some of the more, you know, powerful, right. popular parts of what is uh, based in Aloha. But that 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 unto itself is, I believe, one of the main reasons why um, the organic artistry of the Hawaiian culture is so powerful because it is born on aloha yeah and it's such and i think beautiful... also because in hawaii you know we we recognize talent and we honor it and we you know we we how do you say um you know we appreciate we have such an appreciation for the arts you know music dance it's so much part of our culture and who we are that when somebody says that they want to be a singer we're like okay yeah let's let's do that let's yeah. harness this this you know talent that we have and let's do it let's go for it whereas you know i think a lot of times people on the mainland or in other parts of the world don't have that kind of support system you know we really have an appreciation for our musicians and you know for our culture hula dancers you know uh, you know, all dancers, right? We just love to to yeah. support that. And and I think that's what helps us in the islands, you know, to have all of this great talent that develops and, and we're able to, you know, share it with the rest of the world, spread the aloha. Yeah, and, and another thing too, uh, that has been just so, so wonderful that peripherally I've been a part of in two different ways is that, local film producers, directors, writers, and actors doing works that are powerful for the for storytelling mm -hmm. because that's what any form of artwork is some way mm -hmm. or form. Yeah, whether it's visual uh, or through, you know, music, audio. Yeah, yeah but the, the, for instance, um, you had done a film but finding Ohana is was that yeah finding uh, Ohana for Netflix yeah forgive me I, I don't in have notes here during I'm not the pandemic yeah <laughs> so I mean there are so many films that have more light-hearted fun uh, storylines to the one that recently is now going through um, uh, all of the festivals and getting a lot of attention once again I'm, I'm forgive me I'm not familiar with the, with the film but the one is um, in Olelo that's being yes in, in, yes, yes Hawaiian yes. yeah. All done and, in, in and, Hawaiian. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, I haven't seen it, but I've seen clips of it. It looks amazing. Yes, but, I, yeah. I promise. I, I will edit in right now <laughs> what the name is. And it, and um, I just think it's such an amazing thing that also these local uh, writers, producers, DPs, directors, actors, musicians, having the opportunity to not only come together as a community here, because there are some groups and, and uh, uh, film theater you know, support and uh, mm -hmm. development groups here, uh, but also being able to weave in such an important uh, part of the history of Hawaii and, mm -hmm. you know, and and the, the, the stories, well, the real come, stories of aloha and love, you know, it's just. Yeah, well, we come from a culture of storytellers, right? Hawaiians didn't have a written language. So everything was oral. Everything was told through story, through song, through dance, that's how we kept our history alive, right? Um, mm. And if it wasn't for that, you know, it would have all been forgotten. And what a shame that would have been. But, you know, I, I guess because it's in our culture that way that, you know, we really, you know, honor that and, and are willing to, to develop and share that with the rest of the world. Yeah, and, and, that's, what I, and that's why I feel so, uh, so grateful 
<laughs> to have my life's journey, you know, however long it may be to have been around the culture and the people of Hawaii and to learn so much so that I'm, I'm totally bobo and spacing the haumana. Oh, yeah, I, the haumana. My goodness, I just got chicken skin. I think Kale just was like, bro, come on, what, you forget? For people um, who don't know, our good friend Kale, Kale Woodford, who... Um, who was a very, very talented director, writer, producer, dancer. He was a, a hula dancer, kumu hula, um, a, Hawaiian, a hula teacher. Um, uh, did this, wrote, directed, produced this uh, beautiful story about hula and, um, and cast me in one of the roles, which was one of the most fun roles I've ever gotten to play in my whole life. It was yeah, the first that's time because that I ever... you had that's because you were able to throw a wet rag at me. That's right. You were in that bar scene. That's right. <laughs> you know, the composer always seems to catch a little bit of uh, does the cameo. <laughs> and what do I do as I get an eye full of bar slop on my face? Oh yeah, my you got it. You got to get that little snippet and, and uh, yeah, I'll put pop it, in it up. Here, edit it in here. <laughs> But um, but yeah, I mean, to be able to 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 work with friends, you know, people that I I love and adore, have known for so many decades, right? And 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 to be able to do a project like this that was so close to our hearts, you know, unfortunately, uh, we lost our kale, but yeah. um, but his story still survives, and that's the beautiful thing, right, about this industry is and music. Uh, that even long after you're gone, it's it's still alive and the stories are still being told. Yeah, and and for me to have been peripherally once again, though I was brought on by Ko to you know do the original score for that. Very uniquely, he goes, "Jeeps, can you do uh, ukulele and strings?" I went, "Let's go." But he was he was willing to take those risks, and he mm -hmm. himself is an actor. Um, his IMDb page and his body of work is just oh. absolutely stunning. Uh, right. From one man theater to major theater as well right. as all uh, that Broadway and, stuff too. Yeah. Film stuff that's and not TV, even on IMDb, right? Another local um, uh, talent. Hawaiian talent yeah. that's just unbelievable. What I loved about the Haumana and how he wrote that though was really showed in the movie the unique. Uh, pop culture current uh, makeup of that halal mm -hmm. and how it transpired and how Johnny Kealoha, who I, he, well, he did that such a was such a great job. character. What yeah. a great, and he was, it was performed so well. Mm -hmm. um, that journey of realistically how powerful and how important halals are still in the continual journey of sharing, you know, the story of, uh, native Hawaii all the way to through to today was so well written and everybody in there did such a fantastic job and it also mm -hmm. broke out some new opportunities for people who didn't act before yeah. to continue on that journey and yeah. that is such that is such the thing about you know what I've learned in all my years here uh, about the power of what aloha the hawaiian culture is about to support and also to support so that others can grow through it yeah you know it is such an it's such an impactful power, powerful thing about um, um the spirit of aloha and uh, i to be a bit uh, just a part of it as the way i am i've been extremely blessed and grateful but as you say the 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 new young performer that just uh is now in the top three i think he just yeah, graduated Tony, yeah. yesterday over kahuku I think oh, I saw he, a video up there that yeah he was there at his he was graduation. able to go to his graduation. I thought he was he's been competing. Oh, I guess I'll finish. Maybe no? they fly already. Oh yeah, you're right. They they probably could have finished and are sworn to secrecy until maybe when, or or, or actually no. You know what? I think I think American Idol is live, so perhaps. Okay. But um, but yeah, good for him because yeah, he's just a student still. I mean, and the 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 way that he is able to his his grasp on music is unbelievable you know for being so young and you know still in school it's well as a beautiful. performer both both with with uh his base local base right as a local artist but then just as a performer too mm -hmm. you know that that smoky but buttery voice of his oh, is beautiful. just it's just it's very much brother is yes i level I, I and and that that's not because of any other reason. Like 
if I stay blind and you put a B mm -hmm. of those two, it's just this tone of that voice. That quality is beautiful. The universe is just channeling, you know, just ah, right, right through that. Not, not, and irregardless of, of court, uh, cultural attachment to the voice as him, as the vessel, you know, I'm just saying yeah. his voice as an instrument is just absolutely stunning. And there's, I there's am, a sound in Hawaii that, that, that's like nowhere else that you cannot, other artists just don't have, you know, it, it makes it very unique to who we are. And, and like, if I heard him sing any other song anywhere, I would know that he was from Hawaii, you know, yeah, because I, he has that quality, that tone. Yes, you're, you're right about that. The, the singers here, I, it's also, from what I believe from the outside looking in, uh, it's also the way in which many, many, many years of music from Hawaii has come out. The melodies that they write mm -hmm. are so soulfully penetrating. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the, the ukulele as an instrument in general, yes, you can play minor chords, you can make it sound sad, you know, based mm -hmm. on performance, but it's such an uplifting, intimate instrument. And what I mean by intimate, my father taught me this when I was a kid, when he's, I'm watching him play piano, he's writing music for all these people, la la la. He's an orchestrator, strings and stuff. And I started playing guitar. And one day he goes, I wish I would have learned how to play guitar. I go, why? He goes, it's, it is for what he was explaining to me, the only instrument that you hold so close to your heart. It's such an oh, intimate instrument. Wow. And then even a, even a more intimate instrument would be the ukulele right because it's, it's smaller so tiny and, yeah. and and you're all impacted oh i'm getting chicken skin already Aye. yeah wow and, i never thought so, of it that way that's so beautiful so the by virtue of the tuning of the ukulele mm -hmm. by virtue of the expression of aloha and and um auna and the messaging of of melody through melody and stuff like that has always been very positive and uplifting mm -hmm. you know even even Gabby's work mm -hmm. with the slack key guitar use and that open tuning yeah. that the mm -hmm. that the uh, Hawaiian artists embraced along with the ukulele. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It's just mm -hmm. to me, I that's my playlist. Yeah. People ask me because you know I I I got heavy metal channel, I got orchestral channel, I got here, I, and I've written thousands of tracks. You're so of music. eclectic. <laughs> uh, I'm just more bobo. It's all those voices in my head, but I just express it musically. But I still, my playlist is Gabby. My playlist is is um, Amy and Willie oh, yeah. and Brother Is and yeah. on and on and on. That's that's what's in my house. And that comes also from my family here. My mother's mm -hmm. still alive, you know, Mahalo Ke Pua. And so is my stepfather. And every morning they get, they listen to music. And it's all local music from, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Great for memory. It never gets old. The, it's also great for memory care, whole different story that I talk oh, about on right. another channel, but memory care and music and the whole thing. And while we're listening to music, they're the most talkative and playing Sudoku and we yeah. talk, you know, we're talking <laughs> bubbles and stuff. The music turns down, everybody go, go nai nai. we got to go take yeah. that. But the music is so powerful, but oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I just went on a rant on that because that was like my, my spiritual jurisdiction. It brings you back. Yeah, it does, you know, yeah. and, um, but with that all being said, um, uh, your, your journey has been phenomenal. And I, I, as a friend, I'm proud when I look at your IMDb, because you, usually it's just, you know, me, you, KO, Tracy, whatever. We have ice cream dates back in the day and right. Phone you know, stacking, just, phone stacking. Right. I remember that people, if you don't know, every time that we would all go out, we had to go get ice cream. And then we, whenever sure we, I would come back into town from the mainland, Right. We and then would, you have to put the phones in this corner so that we would have to turn off all the phones. Right. And whoever you know? had to grab their phone first would buy ice yeah. cream. Yeah. <laughs> ice cream was expensive, bro. We go bubbies. It's like, oh, God, dollar tree 80, no more. But um, I've never really sat down and look at your body of work. Look at your body, but not the body of work. Oh, <laughs> oh, my eye, babe. I'm kidding. Sorry. <laughs> So no, bad. But, eyes. Because no, but when we, I look we just know each other. We're just friends. We're family. We're Ohana. You know, it's like we don't we don't need to know, you know, what the other person's resume looks like in order to love them. You know, I know that's, that's true. And, but I did yeah. say to you when, when we were talking to prepare for the podcast, I did say that, you know, 
because that's very true. I've never looked at your IMDb until it was like, oh, yeah. I do some research research for the podcast. And then I think I told you, I found a clip of you in one of the more recent TV shows. I don't know if it's the BMF or something where you're having sexual relations with somebody <laughs> or, or you're still in bed. Oh, and I was like, you all uncomfortable, yeah. <laughs> was it? Off, 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 off. That's that's I that's, know. <laughs> that's pralines and cream girl. That's not that's not who I want to be looking at all oh, over. Right? You know? That's so you know. true. That's you know, so to, funny. But you know, and, and it's like I'm a whole other character. I don't even think of that as being me either. You know, because yeah. when I'm in it, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's it's choreography. It's you know, I have to think about all this other stuff. There's nothing like sexy about it at all. Believe me, right. when you're when you're doing it, it's. It's like you got to think about, OK, where's the camera? What is what's going next? Where's what am I supposed to be doing here? It's like, you know, oh, better watch my back on this wall or, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, there's so much other stuff to think about. But um, but I know, yeah, but still I, yet the end. I told product, my mom though, she cannot like, watch the show. She can't. Yeah, watch the, the end product is like I still was like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, too close, Kels, too close. <laughs> listen, um, I, I can't thank you enough. I know that you're not even at your main house right now. You're on the East Coast because you're busy shooting. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am for how busy you've been. And thank you. uh, even more excited to know that you have a couple of uh, voiceover video game things coming out. So I can hardly yes. wait. Uh, to hear about that. And um, <laughs> I, once again, I, I thank you so much for sharing uh, so much, you know, in, in a different way that you might, you know, you know, being that I, I can, I can poke those buttons. I know where to go. <laughs> stay, stay, you know? I can't thank you enough for joining me. So uh, everybody, uh, you. if you guys uh, want to support Kelly, she has her Instagram and everything, want to hang out and yeah, uh, she, I'll put them all down below. Also, those I'm of at you, Kelly who on everything. At yeah. Kelly Hood, everything okay. You yeah. get blue check mark everything. Yeah, except not Twitter. I never buy. Oh, I'm not gonna <laughs> pay for you. that. See? Yeah, <laughs> nah, 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 nah. you shouldn't. No, but, you need. but I'll have all her information down below. And for those of you who want to support the channel, thank you so much. You know, buying the cup of coffee, hang out with me on Twitch while I learn Final Fantasy and all these video games. I'm like Grandpa <laughs> Gamer and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, again, Kelly, thank you so much for hanging out. Thank know, you. What, what, what time is it for you over so there? So good Stop to me. talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Hour that's and a half, you. almost two hours. Yeah. Not much long. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. Time flies. Time flies. All right, dear. Yeah. You take care of yourself, uh, everybody. Okay. Uh, this was Kelly Hu here on the podcast. I was so grateful. Dear, take care of yourself. Aloha. <laughs>